Well, um, thank you very much, uh, all the panelists, for being here willing to do this. Thank you to all the um, uh, parts of the university that have put this on. I won't name them. They've already been named, I think. Uh, um, this is to talk about uh, what globalization means uh, for universities, but in particular for Columbia. And uh, I think we want to begin with the observation that Columbia is incredibly international uh, and global already. Uh, you can cite, cite all kinds of statistics. One of the largest number of international students uh, of any university in the United States and programs that uh, 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 offer expertise on parts of the world and on global affairs that are really quite extraordinary, uh, maybe even unmatched by any other institution. We go on and on about the global international success story of Columbia, and it's almost impossible, of course, to um, think about Columbia without New York City and, and that sense of, uh, of uh, globalization in which we live day in and day out. So that's a, a, a given. Nevertheless, I think a lot of us feel that, uh, maybe most of us feel, that the world has changed really quite substantially, quite radically even, in the last decade, even the last five years. Um, and the university world always stands in a somewhat uh, removed basis from what's happening in the world. We don't follow current events and the, that's not our sort of role in life. We try to think about knowledge and deep knowledge. We work on things for a long time. We, uh, we really are very um, slow moving quite deliberately. Uh, nevertheless, we do want to be part of the world. We don't want to be completely uh, removed and therefore we want to know what is happening in the world so that we can adjust as we see fit according to scholarly standards and teaching standards you know what is happening in the world these are the new issues or I should think about our issue my issue differently so we want to do that um, so the question then becomes if the world has changed radically and we need to talk about that if the future looks like it's going to be quite a different world from what it has been, uh, and this has happened very quickly, what does the university need to do to help us in our teaching and research and our public service uh, to be more responsive uh, to the world as it is? So um, Columbia is a very global place already, very international, but the world has changed change significantly and we're trying to think through what we need to do to better serve that world in our teaching research and public service so we have five uh, students here uh, I have no idea how they've been selected um, <laughs> there must be some kind of uh, criteria that has led uh, to to this uh, very happy uh, result and um, I'm going to begin by asking each of them, just very quickly, say who they are, where they are at Columbia, what it is that has happened to them while they've been here uh, that relates uh, to globalization and the university and the theme. So we begin. Hi, I'm Stephanie Wilhelm. I'm a senior at the college, majoring in economics and statistics. Um, and so what is part of my global education is that I spent two summers working abroad. I spent my first summer working in Germany and my second summer working in Dublin for the U.S. Department of State and the Embassy. Um, and then part of my coursework, a lot of my, some of my classes have allowed me to do final projects for the classes where I was able to analyze global issues, whether it was the Hong Kong real estate market for econ class or the European real estate market um, or comparing the stock markets between Europe and the United States. Um, so all of this has engaged in my global education, something which started from birth because I spent my life moving and traveling around the world and something which Columbia allowed me to continue to do. Hi there. Can you hear me? 
My name is Mark Stuthers, and I'm a junior studying mechanical engineering and minoring in East Asian studies at Columbia. Um, in terms of international experience, last summer I spent two months studying in South Korea. So I was able to study North Korean politics, Korean language, in conjunction with uh, mechanical engineering research. So that was an interesting sort of combination on the other side of the world. And in addition, I was born and raised in Vancouver, Canada. So I have a number of different sort of international experience to draw on. Hi, my name is uh, Catherine, or Kate Schultz. I'm a double major in the college, studying um, East Asian studies and Middle Eastern, South Asian, and African studies. Um, so, of course, my sort of global experience in education at Columbia is kind of self-explanatory. But um, in addition, I would have to say that I spent last summer studying at the Kyoto Consortium um, in Kyoto, Japan, uh, studying Japanese at an advanced level and also conducting research for my senior thesis. Um, in my senior thesis for the East Asian Studies major, I was actually able to combine um, both of my majors, both of my interests in the Middle East and in East Asia, and explore them sort of simultaneously within, my, within this project. So that was a great experience. Hi, I'm Aaron Liskov. I'm a senior in the college majoring in British history. Um, I think my global experience here has mainly consisted in discovering that Columbia is one of the most self-conscious universities in regard to its undergraduate education. And so I've basically spent the last four years really thinking about what this experience for me is supposed to accomplish. And um, along the way, I spent last year in Cambridge. So, Hi, I'm Erica Kassman. I'm a senior in comparative literature and society, and I do French and Spanish. Um, for me, a lot of my global experience has come directly from my major because it is comparative in nature and it's already built on distributions wherein you have to dis study a certain geographical region. You have to do courses in an advanced level of a foreign language where you do reading and writing in that foreign language and you also have to take your other foreign language to a certain level. Um, so I've been able to focus in both Latin America as well as um, Francophone countries around the world and specifically in Algeria. I wrote two more or less theses um, on the idea of identity in Algeria and pluralism, looking at questions of ethnicity and language. And I did spend last spring abroad at Reed Hall, so one of Columbia's abroad institutions. Great. So thank you very much for being here. So I want to get a sense uh, at the beginning of how you see your world in the, the future. Um, what do you think you'll do? over the next um, 20 years, and, uh, <laughs> and, and, um, and, you know, how does that, you're going to live in the United States, you're going to go abroad, you're going to work in the financial services industry, or are you going to go to, are you going to be academic, so you're going to, what do you think, Erica? Start with um, you. I'll start because I do know what I'm doing next year. I'm going to be pursuing my JD at Duke Law School, and I'll be in their JD LLM program studying international comparative law. So I will have to go abroad next summer and study at their Geneva or Hong Kong. So let's, let's just pause on that because I, I, I'm an expert on law schools. I, I know. Uh, yeah. that, that, so you're wanna, going to go to law school and you're going to do international and comparative law. And then ideally, I don't know exactly what sector I want to work in yet. Yeah. But I would like to be based in the United States, but then also going abroad, whether it's for two years or five years, and really helping to facilitate and mediate some sort of agreements between whether it's nations or businesses that are trying to work mm -hmm. in the United States across national borders because mm -hmm. I do see our world as intensely globalized and interconnected. But you see, you see going to work as a lawyer, yes. as an attorney, and, but working in the international sphere. And you see nations as needing the services of, of uh, legal specialists and, and is this a UN? kind of role or a law firm role really that, that works in? Um, I think on a, I would like to work in a more practical aspect, if I may. Yeah. Um, just trying to help facilitate everyday matters. Yeah. Because anymore, so many businesses, companies, law firms, so many issues are transnational. Yeah. And I would like to facilitate that. In right. How did you get this interest? I really don't know. 
No. I was originally led to comparative literature and society, honestly, by flipping open Columbia's you, major. You what? I was originally led to my major by flipping open the book um, uh -huh. the summer before I came here, and I was like, oh, that looks interesting. Mm -hmm. And then I think a lot of professors along the way really fostered my experience and the type of learning that I was doing, the way that my mind was being open to new places, just the open opportunities that I had by speaking more than one language. Okay. So we have um, an international lawyer in the making here. I hope so. Okay. Aaron? Uh, next year I'm going to be teaching high school social studies in San Antonio. This is a Teach for America? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so that has some international components, but... But, but after Teach for America, that's two years, right? Yeah. Yeah. I'm actually... I want to know the next 18. Right. Oh, well, I'm hoping that... <laughs> I actually th am expecting and hoping that Teach for America or teaching in San Antonio will be um, a formative experience in that respect. Um, a lot of, especially the last p panel, a lot of the um, deans were talking about how um, education is supposed to expose you to unfamiliar experiences and to kind of wake you up. Yeah. And in one respect, um, I'm not sure that Columbia has, has really done that. For me, I mean, that might not be Columbia, it could have just been sort of the uh, trajectory that I took, but I'm looking forward to teaching in a sort of, um, in a high school that will be much different from any place that I've really ever encountered in my life. Yeah. And that's much more, not a geographic factor, but um, I think it's really a class thing. Yeah. And You're not from Texas. So. No. Yeah. Um, Where are you from? From Westchester. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so you are doing international work. That's right. <laughs> right outside of uh, New York City region. That's, um, but I, I don't really think I can make a decision about the next yeah. 18 years until I know no, what I think life this is, is like a, there. This is a very interesting and I think very, um, my experience uh, with my own children and, and uh, with <coughs> young people is that a lot of students graduate not knowing what they want to do. And Teach for America is one of the preeminent institutions for very talented young people who don't quite know what they want to do with this. Or they want to break from this in the two-year aspect of it. And I guess I, I want to pick up, though, on the you haven't found at Columbia the sort of thing that would, like Erica read the brochures about Columbia and wants to be an international lawyer, what might, what might have happened for you here that didn't happen? I mean, that, that could have happened. I, I mean, I think it's almost Columbia's fault that <laughs> I, uh, no, I say that as a, I say that as a compliment. I think it's Columbia's fault that I've become a little bit more skeptical of long-term plans. I mean, I, I suppose I might have followed in the family tradition and gone to law school and, yeah. and things of that nature, but Columbia is already a very kind of challenging environment that exposes you to different um, people and ideas that uh, you, you, wouldn't have, you wouldn't have thought about yeah. before. And, and um, one of those things and this is the reason that I'm enthusiastic about Teach for America, is that um, the education that I received was much different from the education that many other people receive. Yeah. And I think that's problematic, and um, I'm looking forward to doing something about it. And you want to you help people. You want to help sure. young people. And, and um, do, you feel, do you feel the presence of a, of a kind of global as you think about what you might do, and or do you, or do you see it? Well, I'm I'm basically going to be in the U.S. and whatever the U.S. is, I'll. We'll come back to that. Yeah. Okay. That's I, probably, I, wanna, I guess the answer. I'm probably. I guess the answer here. is. I guess the answer might be no. I mean, I don't yeah. consciously feel like the global aspect. What's of happening in the is, world is. is yeah. I mean. I guess there's, to some extent, I mean, if every conversation about education will reference the fact that South Korea calls their teachers nation builders and yeah. Finland has the best kind of uh, 
teacher salaries and training system. So in that respect, I think there's some question about our global competitiveness, but I think it's a matter of also just our kind of, I think it's also a local question about what yeah. kind of community we want to have here, yep. um, regardless of, of how we see the rest of the world. Yep. Okay. Um, well, I'm also a senior, so next year I actually decided I would like to take a year off and enter the workforce well, a while to um, get some experience, figure out a little more concretely what I'd like to do. Um, but in this, uh, in the fall of 2012, I plan to enter law school, like Erica, and I actually have very similar ambitions to Erica, funnily enough. Um, I'm really interested in the field of international law. Um, not so much international law in the corporate sense, but I'm particularly interested in going into perhaps diplomacy or nonprofit work internationally because I feel that um, particularly America needs people who were educated and knowledgeable about these other regions in the legal field, in diplomacy, in the government. Um, I think that sometimes that's lacking and I hope that we can get people who actually have really taken this upon themselves to learn a lot about these areas and developed a passion for it and um, bring that to their work instead of just knowing about the politics or the sort of economics, the data, the statistics, but they actually have a really good feel for the people, the religion, the culture. So. And, and did this, um, does this come from picking up a brochure at Columbia or did it <laughs> come from something else? Um, a little bit of a funny story, I suppose. Uh, both my parents are scientists, PhD scientists, so a little unusual for me to be um, interested in East Asia and the Middle East, but um, my father always had a lot of uh, students from China and they would give him presents. Um, a lot of these pres presents included sort of tapestries that was sort of hang around my house. And when I was little, I looked at them and I thought that they were completely fantastic. Um, so in high school, I took whatever courses I could. I completely ignored European history and focused on Chinese, Japanese, um, any sort of history like that that I could. I was lucky enough to go to a high school that offered that. So I actually knew, and one of the reasons why I came to Columbia was specifically their East Asian Studies program, which is for sure one of the top East Asian Studies programs in the United States. Um, I've had a fabulous experience in that program, and I would not regret it for a second or change my mind for a second. Um, then. The summer before I came, I happened to take a trip to the Middle East, and I completely fell in love with the Middle East then. So I started taking a couple courses, dabbling in it at Columbia, and because of the strength of the professors and the way that they were able to sort of grab your interest and hold it and make you want to learn more about the region, I decided to then go for a double major. Okay, Mark? Well, as I'm sort of the only engineering science major on the panel, my next 20 years might look a little different than some of the other panelists. So I've sort of broken it down into a one-year, six-year, 13-year. I'll explain <laughs> each of these three components. That's, that's how they teach you to think in engineering school, so, don't they? The... As I'm a junior, I actually have one year left at Columbia. Mm -hmm. So that's also a little different than some of the seniors here. Mm -hmm. Now, in terms of my first three years at Columbia, I've been involved in a lot of different things. Um, I've done Engineers Without Borders, Global China Connection. Um, I was in the Lunar Gala Fashion Show this year. I've got to see sort of how, how these sort of like small level inner workings work, which is kind of cool. But one of the sort of conclusions I've come to through all these experiences is that many, many, many things in the world happen on a small scale. And they may affect positive change on a small scale, but I'm most interested in sort of taking those small inner workings of positive change and expanding them so that I can affect positive change on a large number of people. So in terms of the plan, um, in the next year, well, sort of to frame this, I sort of see that there are many sorts of projects that I would like to do. But the problem facing most people with the technical skills to do these projects is that they don't have the capital to fund them. So the next year, um, I'm working on a, a startup project right now. So the plan is sort of, in the last year of Columbia, continue fostering my engineering skills and building the startup so that at the end of Columbia, the startup could be sold so that the funds could go into something of an incubator during grad school. So then the next six year chunk, I plan to study engineering at Stanford or MIT. And then that capital from the next year will be in something of an incubator. 
so that after coming out of grad school, I'll emerge with the contacts, the capital, and the technical skills that I can draw from to work on large-scale projects to affect large sort of positive change in the world. So you're going to make a lot of money <laughs> and then go to graduate school and then go out. And what are you going to do in the remaining um, 14 years? Well, the, the remaining 13. 14 years... I mean, what, what kind of job? I'm sort, you... I'm sort of talking that seven years from now, I want to be in a position with partners, technical skills, and a capital fund to draw from to sort of play, as I would say. And I'm going to define play as meaning, say, OK, um, maybe I want to go to France and open a chain of stores selling a particular good. Maybe I, I want to go to Korea and revolutionize the education system. But the thing is that while at Columbia, I've talked to lots of people who want to do some sort of projects, but oftentimes their interests diverge from me. So in some ways, rather than just myself drawing from these sort of technical skills capital, it's alongside a few other people. So we can pick and choose sort of the skills, the capital, the connections to make things happen. Okay, Stephanie. Uh, so what I would ideally see myself doing is moving and traveling around the world. Uh, it's something I did growing up. I lived in 12 dozen states growing up. I traveled a lot in Europe because my mom's from Europe and my dad's parents are from Europe. Um, and so it's something that I felt that benefited my education and my ability to connect with different types of people and something I want to continue to do. Um, so I also will be pursuing a law degree and also taking a year off to do that beforehand. Uh, but I'm using my law degree to stabilize and like ground my knowledge. Um, I want to then enter, work for a couple years as a lawyer and then enter the business world and get my MBA hopefully also. Um, and I want to work in transactional agreements, whether it's trade agreements, opening up businesses in different parts of the world, helping with economic development, um, and really see the business world from different countries' perspectives and be able to move around and do that in different regions of the world. Okay, so we have three people going to law school. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> I see, yeah, right, right, it was, um, okay, so now I want to go, let's go away from each of you individually and what you're going to do, and I want to ask you, um, how do you see the world that you will live in in the next decade or two decades? And in particular, do you see the United States as continuing to have the kind of role in the world it has today? You see it having getting stronger and its economy being even more vibrant than it is uh, certainly now, but uh, even than it has been. Um, or do you see the United States on a slow decline with Standard & Poor's continually downgrading the American uh, governmental um, uh, uh, budget? Uh, do you see the, do you, do you see, are you, do you look at a bright future? Do you see a wonderful world you're entering? Or do you see one that's of concern? Stephanie? Um, I guess I have two parts to this. I see America kind of like staying <coughs> where it is, but it still has the potential to move forward and be what it, be the superpower that it is. But it needs for education to be reshaped. Um, part of the thing is you always hear the reports that like science is more important and we're not teaching that in the States. And so I would say in, in grounding our knowledge in humanities and whatnot, you still need to provide those technical skills. Also, you need to provide students with like real exposure to real world problems, be able to gain those technical skills in the classes that they're doing. Um, and I see it also as a smaller world. So yeah, even if America doesn't continue to rise and kind of stays where it is, it's not quite as important for our futures because we can move to different countries. We can work in tra transnational uh, transnational like uh, jobs. It won't quite matter as much um, because we still have the resources to the world and the world's becoming more and more open to us that we can still utilize the things that are from abroad and bring them back into the states. Do you see democracy spreading around the world or do you see authoritarianism rising up and conflicts? Uh, do you worry about world wars? Do you, or not? I mean, I literally, I really want to know what you, we want to know what you think and what you think about the world as it's evolving over. How do you see that? I mean, I definitely, I don't worry about world wars. I more worry about specific groups trying to 
whatever their beliefs are, trying to enforce that on other people. But I don't think that anybody wants to get in a world where we're all fighting all the time. Um, any war that would happen would be more specific attacks. Um, what I do see, I see democracy spreading because I see that our generation, whether it's in the States or in different countries, they're more in tune to the world through technology. Um, and that none of them want to go into a war, none of them want to have. That's want to a be very controlled. important. Now, this is something I want to pin down. Do you feel like you are part of a generation that wants greater openness, freedom, democracy, and so on? Do you, do you interpret what's happened with the Arab Spring in that way? I definitely do interpret it mm -hmm. that way. Through my travels, through I like work with Ivy Council. We host uh, delegations from other countries, from China, from um, the Europe and the Middle East, and send students over there. Everyone that I've met that's in our generation, they want that um, because they've been exposed to it. And n no one wants that. Once it's once you open that door, no one wants it taken away. It doesn't really matter where okay. they are in the world. I want to know where, whether as you each make your comments, whether you share that view. I think for me, it really comes down to two things. Um, one is ideas, and one is understanding. So, to sort of share a personal anecdote which will tie into ideas, um, I was in Tianjin for a day in China last summer, and I was just struck. And this is sort of one little thing that struck me on the whole of being in Asia, that we were actually, we were staying in a very nice hotel, but when I arrived, I was a little bit shocked because the entire sort of driveway was gone and there were like a hundred workers reconstructing it and this hotel was still open. So I was, I was just, what sort of struck me about that is the incredible energy and vigor that some nations are approaching construction and moving forward with. And in some ways, I don't really see that in America in the, in sort of a, a fundamental context. So how this, this sort of relates to ideas. I do see America on the rise, per se, but I see other countries more on the rise. And sort of what could lead to either America continuing to stay the world superpower or declining is gonna be tied to ideas in terms of the number of ideas, the quality of ideas, because if America is still producing the best thought, the best technologies, the best legislation, then it will remain powerful, because that's a very tangible thing. But at the end of the day, if America is just sort of relying on what happened before, they might decline. Do you think the world is becoming more open and tolerant and, and democratic and or do you see it as um, not moving that way? What's your answer that, uh, that Stephanie, do you agree with Stephanie? In some ways. I would say it's very hard to give an absolute answer to that question because... No, I know. It's, it's just a matter of feel. Nobody's you know, giving a grade here. It's, it's, um, <laughs> it's just, do you... Do you feel like the world, it's a bright future? Wait, so are we, do we want a bright future or are we talking about understanding? Um, you know, I dem mean, democratic, spread of democracy, openness. I think it's getting a little better. Mm -hmm. And I think that as it continues to get a little better, it might swoon down a little worse mm -hmm. before it gets a lot better. Because sometimes as you're like slowly edging up, sort of hit the top of a mountain. Mm -hmm. and Thanks, Mark. Kate? Um, well, I suppose in relation to the question about democracy and openness, I have a sense, um, I can't back this up with sort of statistics or data at this point or right. you know, on the spot, but I have a sense that in our generation worldwide, because of the impact of the ability to easily reach out to students all across the world, learn ideas, see how honestly people thousands and thousands and thousands of miles away from us live and work and act on a day-to-day -day basis. I think that our generation does have a sense of greater opportunity, greater possibilities, greater sort of openness and 
because of these opportunities, they would desire more of the freedom to pursue them and thus perhaps more democratic systems of government. I don't necessarily um, see the movements going on in the Middle East now to be emblematic of sort of a demo like worldwide democratic revolution, but I do think that they are um, perhaps sort of um, flips of light that we can see um, and that perhaps, and we can see how they've been spreading throughout the region and also spreading to other countries and perhaps students, people of our generation will see that, be inspired to stand up for themselves, be inspired to pursue and um, seize what they want within their country, within their government. However, I also think that on a macro scale, when you look at history, there are waves of democratic revolutions and there are waves of dictatorships and there are sort of waves of authoritarian governments and it's very hard to predict what will happen in the future. Um, not all democracies are great, some are very corrupt, some are perhaps, um, I'm sure there are people across the world who would rather live in an authoritarian government that gives them sort of a standard of life and opportunities that they, um, that they see as beneficial to themselves over a corrupt democratic government that um, they don't see as beneficial to themselves, so I think it's not as easy as a sort of simple democracy or authoritarian um, Sort of dichotomy, uh, but. <laughs> but I'm interpreting you as saying it's complex. Complex, right? But there is a there is a basic optimism in your there is, in your voice and in what you say. Right, I think that there is a basic optimism, and it, and it has to do again with young people and having access to information and knowledge about what's happening in the world, and that feeds a sense of wanting democracy. And right. Wanting, uh, and, and not wanting more, and not wanting to, th that's all positive. Just though to, on this, um, you know, everybody's connected sort of theme, there is a view, which all of you undoubtedly know, that that interconnectedness has increased the talent pool so that your now, your generation, is not just competing against the 300 million people in the United States and uh, or in your generation uh, some million, you're competing against hundreds of millions of people. The talent pool is now much larger and there's a real question whether you're going to be able to have the same quality of life, standard of living that prior generations have had in the United States for the past 50 years precisely because uh, it, it's now, you're, do you feel that way? None of you, I, I bet none of you does at this stage. I actually absolutely do. Um, perhaps you, it's because- It's a more competitive, you feel like you're facing, you're going to absolutely. face. Absolutely. Um, perhaps it's because the specific jobs that I'm looking for or the specific areas that I want to enter into, such as sort of diplomacy or nonprofit international work, but I absolutely feel that, um, for example, when you apply for a job that wants um, both English um, proficiency and proficiency in Arabic or Chinese or whatever, yeah. you are directly competing with people who perhaps have lived here for years and have great English speaking skills as well as Chinese, Arabic, um, et cetera, speaking skills. And that is in direct competition with you. Um, I think very, that, right. That's so, very interesting. Again, sir. And so Mark and Stephanie, would you say the same thing? You feel like you're part of a, a much bigger talent pool? competition for well, yes? In, in some ways I would say it's been beneficial for me since I'm a Canadian citizen. Um, but so sort of from that angle, I think that in a way it can give people who wouldn't normally have a chance to compete, the opportunity to compete. Yeah. Okay. Yes, Aaron. It seems like there are three questions floating around. There are a lot of questions. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm not a political or a foreign policy analyst, so I, I mean, you can take what I say at face value, but I, I'm not as optimistic about changes that are taking place, so much as confused. And if anything, I think the safer interpretation is to say that right now we're in a little bit of a global crisis moment. And it's very tempting, but probably deceiving to interpret all of the uprisings and the um, protests as kind of 
translations of what we think of as democracy and openness. Um, they could go in many other different directions, and I'm not sure that um, we really understand what's at the bottom of them. On the other hand, I have a hunch that one of the causes, I mean, if a lot of the interpretations of what is happening around the world when we say the world is moving in this direction are really reflections of how kind of we feel about our lives and um, more than what we actually know about uh, those other places. And on that basis, my hunch is that lots of these very sweeping social changes are the outcome of the fact that I think people are really concerned about whether their lives will be dignified, or, or not will be, but concerned that they are not dignified in a really meaningful way. Um, and a, a lot of the panelists have been, ta uh, been talking about how uh, the United States might be falling behind in these kinds of uh, material standards and um, scientific knowledge and, com and those currencies of competitiveness. And I find lots of that, um, um, this might get me in trouble with Teach for America to say something like this, but I find a lot of that rhetoric kind of depressing because I think that those kinds of conversations, if they're not really kept in perspective, will really exacerbate a lot of this anxiety. Um, I think a lot of undergraduates probably are not as concerned about whether they're going to be making, whether they're going to be the executive or the top professor so much as whether they're going to have some other um, reference point for what makes life valuable. And the, um, the universe, university certainly, I think, education in general really needs to recommit itself to that question. Not, not e it may not even involve thinking about you know, what's happening to America? Is it like, is its GDP growing? Is it, is it declining? Is our oil supply correct? But think about, thinking about what's right five feet in front of us. Mm -hmm. Is my life um, where it is? Um, who are the people? What, what's the community like that I have? Am I um, mm -hmm. satisfied I, with it? So, I understand. I think very sure. important for everybody to feel they can say what they, uh, what they really believe and feel about these issues. And, so we, we respect that. On that score, Erin, do you feel good no. about the prospects I, of, of this country and the, and the world? No, I mean, I'm... You're, I think, you're concerned. Yeah, I'm very concerned. I think that the changes that are taking place, um, even in America, are such that for students, it, it's much harder to um, have some kind of Mm -hmm. cultural grounding, um, some kind of church, as they would have called it in the 19th century. Mm -hmm. um, do you think really there's, do you feel like, uh, to put words in your mouth, but sure. you feel like there's, uh, just interpreting some things you said earlier, that there's too much emphasis in today's world and including in university life on the economy and making money and you said GDP and so on, that this is a that we're not focusing on the ends of life in, the, in a much more profound and meaningful sense. It's different at every university, I mean, but I think the trend is definitely going in that direction yeah. and it's an unfortunate one. Yep, I understand. Thank you very much. And Erica. I'm actually incredibly optimistic about where our world is headed. Um, whether or not, and for me it doesn't matter if America remains the superpower that it currently is or has been for the last hundred odd years. Um, what is important is the increased globalization that's going on. I had the fortunate experience to take a seminar on the origins of globalization while I was in Paris, looking at the Iberian explorations and how they went to Latin America and to China, and how it completely revolutionized the concept of distance, and how we have just grow continued to grow from there, and what we have with the internet now, and with the way we can travel, and the way that borders, national borders, are tending to disappear or to become much more fluid, not matter as much because there is so much interaction going on. And I don't know if democracy is going to be on the rise, but I do sense that pluralism is on the rise. I did happen to write my thesis on questions of pluralism in Algeria, 
which is a nation very similar to the United States in many respects. There are many ethnic groups, many religious groups, multiple languages going on, much in the way that the United States calls itself a melting pot and how you work through that, how you respect all of those voices, let all those voices be heard, and to not silence that creative energy, but to raise it up. Mm -hmm. And if the world can have many more voices joining in, and I don't see it as a negative aspect that I might be competing with more people, but incredibly enriching and such an opportunity. In this seminar that I referenced, I was taking, I was in the seminar about 25 students from all over the world. Uh, not a sing I think there were maybe two people from similar countries, mm -hmm. but that's about it. And to hear their perspectives, to be in a classroom like that was absolutely incredible. And that's the kind of world that I want to live in and that I see us living in in the future. Mm -hmm. Okay. So a lot of optimism, some concerns by Aaron, but a lot of optimism uh, about how the world would evolve and feeling part of a generation that has this extraordinary opportunity to connect and build and, and experience the world and, and that leads to natural desires for greater openness, and those kinds of themes and I think that's very uh, important. Um, let me ask you and let's do this quickly, are you, do you all feel sort of representative of people of other students at Columbia. Let's talk about the other people, the other students, and so your views about them. And are they, or do you feel like uh, you know you're you're kind of unique in the way you look at life and see the world and want to be part of this global world? Anybody? By nature, maybe when we apply to the school, mm -hmm. um, tends to invite a particular student, and I think that the desire to learn and the desire for some kind of open-mindedness fostered very much by the core that we do have here that does draw many students, gives us, at the very least, a similar foundation for looking at the world. Mm -hmm. okay. Whether or not we have the same outlook in the end, we've all kind of been granted that, that mm -hmm. capacity and that willingness to have discourse. Mm -hmm. Like we all apply because it's in New York, it's in the most global city that you can get um, in the States. Um, and so we're all have been exposed to global issues, whether all of us want to go conquer the rest of the world, that's not true. But we also want to be exposed to that and have that be a part of our lives in some way. Mm -hmm. Your question, I mean, Columbia students are, <laughs> Columbia students are, are so diverse and, and Columbia is kind of such a elusive concept in terms of its community that to say that I'm speaking for other people, I, I really, Honestly, I'm not sure. Yep. Okay. I think I'll side with Aaron on that one. Um, but on the other hand, I think that we are representative of the undergraduates in terms of what we want for the future in a sort of general sense. We want, you know, we want a job, but we also want something, like Aaron said, something a little more meaningful in our lives. Um, we don't just, most Columbia students, most, maybe not all, but most, aren't necessarily completely concerned with making three or whatever figures. They do want a little more interaction with the world, a little more meaning. Um, in addition, I think all of us, um, as we've raised in previous points and other discussions we've had among us, have a lot of concerns as undergraduates about uh, aspects of the university that perhaps help us help founder our education and other aspects that we have to fight against in order to get the education and the experience that we want. So in those aspects, we do represent, um, a, I think, a large part of the undergraduate population. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to speak to a slightly different sort of definition of a Columbia student. In some ways, I feel like Columbia unites people who want to succeed. And the Columbia student body is diverse in some ways to the extent that that definition of succeed really can't be defined. It's just many different pinpoints for many different people. but sort of to contrast two things. I've been amazed by Columbia. It's been an incredible transformative experience in my life. Um, I'm a first generation college student and three years from now, three years ago, I could have never imagined where I would be at today intellectually. And in some ways on a global context, that really worries me because Columbia can bestow like almost such a good education on people, it's incredible. And 
that creates almost a distance, which worries me at times. A distance from? A, a distance from students that don't have the opportunity uh, to have this education. Mm -hmm. And in some ways, I feel like people who have this sort of intellectual knowledge are able to foster families which can continue in this tradition, which in some ways, I feel, segregates society a bit, which is a little worrying to me. You know, there is a view that the globalization uh, is causing uh, serious dislocations in the economy here and then abroad. Uh, a lot of disagreement about that hypothesis. There is a view, however, that's more widely accepted, I think, that globalization is leading to very great income inequality and life opportunity and life satisfaction equality. Uh, and I think of this uh, in relation to um, uh, what Mark just said. Do you feel that? Do you feel that you're part of a uh, world that is uh, distributing the benefits uh, in ways that are quite unfair and, and need to be redressed? Aaron, have I tapped into something you believe? Absolutely. Yeah. I think you can even see it at Columbia based on the diversity of the student body. I mean, that's one of the reasons that I became enthusiastic about Teach for America very early is that even though Columbia, as Mark said, does tend to attract a kind of uniquely motivated student, um, maybe not always, um, but um, there are still very vast disparities um, between the students who are coming into the schools based on the um, backgrounds that they're coming from, and they really do kind of penetrate our community itself. Um, they don't completely evaporate when, um, once everyone arrives. Um, the question of, I think that, I mean, one of the, I think one of the things that sort of appeals to me about British history is that I think that we're in some ways in kind of like a Victorian moment, and the Industrial Revolution is some, in some ways an analogy for the kinds of changes that um, we're experiencing today. And they are, there's new economic frontiers, but we're also noticing, um, we're also more sensitive to um, different people and, and how they live. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so, what so are yeah. The, yeah. Okay. So what are the, what are the biggest issues and, uh, that you think the world faces, right? You know, climate change or inequality or figuring out how to employ hundreds of millions of youth that uh, are unemployed, authoritarianism, so all of those things, is that? Uh, I think it's communication. You think it's communication? I do. I think that as our generation grows up, there's going to be a lot of difficulty because of our the way we're habituated to texting one another as opposed to speaking together face to face. And um, one of the things that we've talked a lot about in our discussions is foreign language and global understanding, being able, like, able to communicate meaningfully with other people, whether or not they come, whether or not they speak from the same, the same language as you do, or whether they come from different backgrounds like Aaron's addressed. I think it's going to be communication, because mm -hmm. if you can foster communication, then you do foster potential. And think about, going back to what Mark said, the mm -hmm. ideas that might arise from mm -hmm. that. What newspapers do you read every day? You all read uh, printed Times. newspapers, I assume. <laughs> you, so you read the New York, New York Times. Times and the Journal. Slate. 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 CNN sometimes. CNN. Okay. What else? BBC. Google articles that I'm interested in are the subjects uh -huh. for Associated Press. So. Uh -huh. But you, you don't read the translation of. I don't know, the German magazine, or uh, you don't, um, you, Al Jazeera, or um, France 24, BBC, these are not? Well, when encouraged by classes, actually, um, and actually a lot of professors do a great job at this, um, they encourage us to look at Al Jazeera, China Daily, or the People's Daily, um, uh, uh, 
several of the Japanese newspapers like the Asahi. Um, and in that case, yes, we do read them, or at least I have. Yeah. Um, but it's more of a, a, it's almost considered like a research tool. It's yeah. actually a fabulous I one. Understand. Um, but I think that in our daily lives, I think that the, like the New York Times is a lot more approachable and we can sort of, we have an idea of the biases that they might have, whereas I'm not always as clear as to the biases of the journalists across the world, whether or not they be um, biases that yeah. I would approve of or disapprove of. Yeah. Okay, so let's go to um, designing Columbia. And, um, <laughs> So now you have this great university in your, um, in your hands. You've had this experience, which you all value deeply, I think, and, uh, of having been here. But um, let's say um, you know, the faculty gives you the right to really change whatever you need to change in order to reflect the university as you see it. What would you do? I would make the education more global in like the actual meaning of the word where students are studying abroad each semester, each year, that you don't need to be uh, in New York for four years to get the same education. You can be in Europe for one year, you know, in the Middle East for another year, in China for another year, gain your language skills, and still take the same kinds of classes, but engage in those issues within whatever issues are facing the country that you're in at the time. Um, I feel that it's more important than like sitting you here in New York you think that in order to understand the world, you have to actually physically be there in that environment. Yeah, it's not that you can't understand all issues by being in New York. No, it's the I, fact that if you haven't been exposed to that, and so many of my friends have never been abroad, you're not going to have that same quite understanding as if you faced a global issue by being in a different country. But you have the internet. You can... <laughs> read things, look at pictures and movies and so on, that's but not enough? There are words, and it doesn't mean mm -hmm. anything to actually have to experience something. Like, I was in Ireland, I was exper experiencing the decline of the Irish economy, mm -hmm. and now when I'm reading by the Irish economy, it's doing even worse. Like, it means more than me than if I just picked it up okay. um, today without that experience. Okay. Here for four years, three of them, you get to be abroad studying. What else? Uh, I would speak to making it a more integrated experience for uh, physical science and engineering students. Because in many ways, Columbia is stressed as a school which offers you the opportunity to study liberal arts and humanities in a real way from an engineering or science perspective, which is great. And if you like really reach out to take that opportunity, it's definitely there. But the thing is, it doesn't, although the opportunity is there, and this is the case in many things at Columbia, not many people take advantage of it. But I'm sorry, at, you're saying there needs to be the opportunity to take for non-scientists to take science? Oh, no, I'm, I'm speaking to uh, science and engineering students yep. to have a more integrated experience with the liberal arts. So I see. sort of to frame one way this might look is that right now, engineering students, they can say do a liberal arts minor. I'm doing one in East Asian studies. Mm -hmm. but. We could, in some ways, Columbia could help to send really sort of useful, skilled scientists and engineers into the world by really like defining for them how is this material directly applicable. So for instance, let's say that an engineer is really interested in Brazil, but there could be the opportunity to take Brazilian courses here. There could be technologies you're studying here that they're both interested in, but the student might have no idea that these things are all connected. So what I'm proposing is that either at the Morningside Heights campus or abroad, students will get the sort of science students will get the opportunity to have an integrated experience with a specific geographic area where both sort of the engineering professors and the liberal arts professors are encouraged to sort of tie in the connectedness. So to make sure I understand, because you said this as we were talking beforehand, and I was a little puzzled, but now I think I'm beginning to see it. So you do have a, your hypothetical student is, a, is somebody who's interested in Brazil. Yes. But interested in Brazil, just interested in the literature, the culture, the language, the life, that kind of interest. It's, it's not, okay. And you want to be able to make it more possible for someone who is in the engineering and science side of the institution to be able to fulfill that interest in Brazil. 
Well, and that may mean going there to study, but it may also mean courses and the like. Is that right? Um, mostly. But in some ways, I'm speaking to developing like a really clear-cut connection. As in, say there could be five or ten courses, say one on Korea, one on Brazil, where the professor is specifically instructed like with ties into, say, the engineering or science implications of the area. Okay. Other changes, other reforms for Columbia? Um, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say something that perhaps is a little controversial, but I think that Please. the university should that. seriously reconsider the way that the core is structured and the classes that students are required to take. So I know you're in favor of eliminating the core? No, absolutely <laughs> not. <laughs> Actually, I have to preface this by saying that I'm actually a fan of the core. That's one of the reasons why I came to Columbia. However, there are aspects of the core that a huge number, a huge amount of the undergraduate population widely um, dislikes, and some of us even even loathe. Um, I would also say that, um, for example, contemporary civilizations and li literature humanities, which are, so to speak, the core of the core, are by and large fantastic courses. Um, and I think that all of us can speak to the how. They open our minds, they help us consider our own world in certain ways, and also help us to then analyze, you know, in sort of, when you're speaking about the global sense, analyze other parts of the world by having that as sort of a fundamental basis by which to do so. However, um, to go into details or specifics, I think that some other courses are sort of tacked on, and while they have their own, um, while they have values, and I actually definitely enjoyed some of them, um, I also feel that they do limit students to pursue other avenues which they might be interested in by having students take so many courses. Actually, I looked at it and calculated it the other day because I was curious, and Columbia undergraduates in the college, about a third of the courses are directly core courses, which means that if you want to double major, you need to know the minute you get into Columbia what you want to do and start taking classes in those, because otherwise you will not be able to double major. Similar with engineering students, and science students, especially like pre-med or bi biology students, they really struggle if they want to explore other avenues that are not directly related to their majors and not part of the core. So some courses that I think are sort of tacked on might include um, uh, music humanities, art humanities, um, uh, university writing, and even to a certain degree frontiers of science. Um, I think that while these courses certainly have their value and um, some students absolutely need a writing course when they get here to help them out with their writing. However, I think the majority of students don't, and I found that similar to Frontiers of Science, the majority of students find Frontiers of Science very easy and very basic, and honestly, they could, you know, read the news or check out sort of a basic book on this, read it in a couple hours and get the majority of what they'll learn from Frontiers of Science. Um, that's maybe a little bit of a harsh criticism, but I think it's true for a lot of students. Um, I also think that um, so for these classes, I think that there's sort of a lower denomination of students that maybe weren't exposed to this in high school through no fault of their own, but they just don't have those skills. And these classes really help them develop those skills. But I think that perhaps there needs to be a way for students who would rather explore something else or something a little more in depth, something a little more challenging than having to take those courses. Similarly, I think that I actually loved art. Um, um, I actually found it fantastic. I love going to the Met. I like learning about art. Um, so I think that, and Music Hum was enjoyable in its own way too, but I think that for me, um, learning, taking a course on sort of maybe um, modern sort of Latin American politics or something like that um, would be a lot more useful than recognizing Beethoven's symphonies um, in this modern world. And I think that perhaps students could have the opportunity of choosing Art Hum or Music Hum. Um, to make one suggestion, because I think that you, it's, it's very, very useful to be able to know, oh, this is Beethoven, this is Mozart, or, Mozart, or this is Rembrandt, this is Van Gogh, this, you know, et cetera. But I think that to have such strong and stringent um, requirements can really take away from the ability of students so to let's, explore. Let's, uh, let's put that question to the, to the rest of the panel. How many of you believe that the core, admirable in deep ways, is too consuming, too large a presence in your educational opportunities while you're here. How many of you believe that? I definitely do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
I haven't truly felt that way, although I really <coughs> do agree with Frontiers of Science and university writing. Um, I felt that Frontiers of Science was kind of an insult. I mean, I did yeah, we don't need to go into that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, do, I did really appreciate all the other aspects. Uh-huh. Okay. I don't. I think the core is um, really the kind of cornerstone of um, what Columbia offers and that it's under, um, we could say that it's under siege right now. And um, I um, respectfully take issue with some of yeah, the things that no, Kate no, says. Um, I think that's a really but, important issue for us. Um, I mean, to me, the criticism of the core is tends, I think, on the basis of whether it's too consuming or not, tends to just express the fact that Columbia students have very busy lives and that um, really um, throws re relief on whether, I mean, do I need to be listening to Beethoven 5 right now um, when I have all this other stuff to do? Um, and I think that there are alternative ways to um, basically just make Columbia students' lives less busy so that they can can focus on things which which actually do matter and 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 think well, think critically about why why um, why Beethoven does matter and um, I think he does mm -hmm. um, and one of the big I mean going back to the questions of suggestions I'm just sort of bewildered about why it's the norm at Columbia to take two more courses than undergraduates at our peer institutions take I mean my my friends at Brown, Harvard, Princeton take four classes a semester at Columbia. Six, five is kind of a minimum. Six is normal. Seven is not abnormal. And that, I mean, if you have that situation and the core curriculum that is substantial, there's going to be some um, tension. And I don't think that means that the core is not a good thing. What I think is, what it means is that Columbia should perhaps, I mean, the way that Princeton resolves this problem is that it doesn't allow Yep. the second major. And I know that would probably be unpopular, but I think that if we believe in the core, some kind of um, real procedural reform that says Columbia students need, can only have so much of a course load um, that it would not inhibit them from really making a okay. strong commitment to what yep. they're doing is important. And, and that's really a, a kind of a home front issue that, that does interact with a lot of the global um, okay, so let me come at this before opening it up to the audience from another slightly different, same issue but different direction. What do you feel should be offered? If you all believe that globalization is kind of where you know, life is going in very profound ways and you want to be part of it in different sorts of ways, what do you feel we should be offering you that you're not getting? I think I would refocus classes that you're not just learning like theory that you're not going to know how to apply, that you actually have to do a project for each class, that you're applying it to something in the real world, that you have to, you know, learn the Excel skills that you're going to need because, you know, employers won't hire you if you don't know how to, if you don't know Excel and yet no one teaches it to us. Uh, you know, taking your econ classes and saying like, okay, we learned microeconomics, let's find a city and like apply this. So you actually understand how it works in the real world. Um, and I would say that even for the core, I guess if I was to re-examine the core, it would be to, you know, walk away with something more than, okay, cool, I've read these books, there's these general issues that all countries and all times have faced, but let's actually try to ground this in something that I can now apply to my real, real life, besides just intellectual discussions with our friends. Uh in terms of changes to Columbia, I think that one thing I would emphasize is sort of interdisciplinary connection across courses and students throughout all four years. Because say in the engineering school right now, the first two years are very different than the last two years. There's a giant disconnect. Uh, the last two years of most engineering majors, there are about 15 required courses. So in some ways, you're not really that connected to people in other majors. So if I was to go out on a limb and suggest a huge change, uh, I would say for the undergraduate level to combine CCNCs. Because okay. I think that would lead to enhanced interdisciplinary work and I think it would remove a lot of confusion that people applying have. Uh, I think I would focus on foreign language and language study. 
because we do have to study at least through intermediate two or pass out of that same level. However, that's often not enough to actually speak a foreign language. Um, yeah, you might understand, you can ask where the bathroom is. But I think it would be wonderful, since we do have all these other courses, to offer something that's maybe two credits meets for an hour or two hours once a week that has some actual structure to the course, whether it's politics, theater, history, um, and you are learning, you're improving your grammar, your speaking skills, your reading, your writing, and also learning something along the way. I think that's absolutely essential in our world. Okay. Uh, and so suppose, just go to this fifth year thing, suppose uh, we're offered to you tuition free um, and support, some financial support, and you can stay here a year and you can study issues of globalization have some faculty for you in small classes and then two weeks you'll go to Amman and by the way you have to pick some subject uh, on which you're going to do you're going to do research and write a significant paper uh, over the course of the year but you're going to also have these informal courses on on um, uh, issues of globalization and you will spend two weeks let's say at each of the centers uh, listening to people there talk about global issues from their perspective, people from the governments of the region, people from business, people from NGOs, academics, activists, whatever, um, and uh, these will be linked technologically, so when you're back here and, um, and in classes you may have people speaking to you from these various places, and of course the idea is not simply to understand the Middle East, it's to understand the Middle East in relation to China and South America and so on. And um, uh, how many of you would sign up for that year? In a heartbeat. I would, definitely. <laughs> I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. Right now, probably not. Uh -huh. no. And why not? I guess my thing is, my biggest question is why can't this be done from freshman year to senior year? Uh, so you why like the idea, but you think it yeah. ought to be incorporated but into I the But I think board. it should be incorporated if you want to make it global you know, have freshmen start getting exposed to this. Mm -hmm. And if people want to take a year to do that, like, let them do this in their fourth or third year. It's a great idea, and I definitely believe that we need to be exposed, that students need to go abroad and do research and talk to government leaders um, and economic people in those different countries, but it doesn't need to be this extra mm -hmm. year. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, I'm not against the idea in principle, but I think that it could have very ne negative ramifications, especially for the preceding four years. and. If there was a fifth year in which it was somehow, I mean, just because it's the fifth year would be some kind of culminating experience, that would dramatically reshape um, what students do during the preceding years. If I knew that I was going to be going out to Oman in my fifth year, my, in the last four years for me would have been extremely different. And I'm not sure that they would have been different in, in necessarily positive ways. How, how would they be different, Aaron, in negative ways? I would, well, in a couple, couple of respects. First, Columbia is already a very, is a relatively, because it's in New York, it's a relatively diffuse community. Mm -hmm. uh, and some people even use the word term atomized. Mm -hmm. um, people are already doing extremely different things from each other already. Um, the core curriculum is kind of a counterbalance to that um, trend because it kind of gets people in the same room. But even the trend within the core right now is centrifugal. It's pushing people in different directions mm -hmm. with the global core. And a fifth year, if students knew that they were possibly preparing for these different international experiences in different countries, it would bear on their undergraduate development by putting them into even more varied um, mm -hmm. directions. So, mm -hmm. and I'm not sure that that's the best, I, I, I mean, I'm, my, my sense is, and this is something that Dean Moody Adams said earlier in the day, that, that the best education balances the global and the local. And part of being an undergraduate, in my kind of personal sense, is learning what it means to have a home and to be part of a community and how to do that. Mm -hmm. And I think a, a fifth year, which um, mm -hmm. sort of spread the undergraduate student body out as much as that description would you would make that part of the undergraduate experience very challenging. And I think that there's a really important value to that undergraduate purpose right now. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, I 
recognize the problems that you talk about, but I still see the program as working within that. For example, I knew I was going to go abroad from age six, maybe, junior year. I knew it was going to happen, but that didn't change my undergraduate experience. And I do agree that it is absolutely vital to have a sense of community and to have a sense of your undergraduate years. But to have the opportunity to do a fifth year as kind of an extra experience, something where you do go along with your classmates for four years, taking your courses, exploring what you want to, and then to have this, what sounds like an incredible moment, incredible opportunity to open your mind, to have that after, uh, I think that's one way in, it, mm -hmm. w it, in which it could work, addressing Aaron's concerns. Mm -hmm. it's like, yes, oh, go ahead. Um, I think it's a fantastic option. Um, I think a lot of so, would love to do it. However, I also think that, and this is the reason why I wouldn't choose that at this moment, after four years at Columbia, which is such a rigorous institution, many seniors are ready to leave their studies and join the workforce for a little while. Um, many, for many, it would be too much of a burden, sort of just mentally, emotionally, to take on another year of studies. Um, I, however, I would really encourage the university to better enable students to study abroad during their four years for a full year, because I actually think that not many students actually study abroad for a full year and even for semesters. Actually, even among us, who you might expect to be the students who would mo be most likely to take semesters or years abroad. I think only one of us actually took a semester abroad. The rest of us studied abroad over summers. This is because with the demands of course, with the demands of majors, wanting to do internships to make ourselves more competitive for entering the workforce later, we simply don't find the time um, to be able to go abroad. And I think that a way that the university could help us to find the time would be perhaps at these global centers to offer, for example, literature humanities, well, probably not literature humanities, but uh, contemporary civilizations, music humanities, art humanities, courses that we must take our sophomore, junior, senior years. But um, so if, we, if they offered these in centers abroad, we would be able to say, oh, well, we can actually complete the core abroad. We don't have to stay here to this do is, these Columbia-centered the, things. Evolve identified one of the biggest right. problems the things that are offered here at Columbia are extraordinary for young people, uh, for you. But they take up so much of your life. And there's so little time for majors and so little time for exploration. And everybody, every faculty member, every department, all the faculty believe that everything that's being offered is really important and, and unchangeable. Um, and that's all completely understandable, and it produces this magnificent undergraduate experience, busy as hell, but a wonderful, wonderful experience. To try to change that, amend it, alter it, is really difficult to do. And, um, and, and the fifth year idea is simply a, a way to accommodate that reality by offering something. But it's got real limitations, as, as you've said. Um, it'd be better if students had the opportunities while they were in the four year, that every student could do, et cetera, et cetera. And we're trying to think about these uh, issues. And there are some proposals on the table and some beginning little programs, uh, including one at Reed Hall that's quite exciting that, that you know, I think will will be meaningful, but how we grapple with this is one of the big issues. Let me open this up now to, uh, to the audience. You've all been terrific. You've been very open and engaging, and uh, it's why we love being here and teaching um, uh, young people. So well, let's just thank them for this. <laughs> Shall we have questions? Yeah. Let's go to the microphone, I think, probably best, yes. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Kieran LaCroix. I work in the Office of Undergraduate Admissions. Um, I just wanted to ask, as you're leaving Columbia, um, based on the fact that the liberal arts system of higher education has been and is pretty unique to the United States, and based on the mission of the university to prepare a global citizen, up for interpretation that definition, of course, um, do you feel like global citizens um, based on your experiences, and do you feel that the liberal arts has gotten you there? Okay, let's take several questions so you can sort of pick which ones you want to answer. So that question is, um, do you feel like global citizens? Have Columbia has prepared you to be that? And has your liberal arts education contributed to that feeling? 
Hi, um, my name is Michael Rand, and I'm a graduate of Teachers College, uh, Columbia. And my question to you is that in a number of the previous panels, people uh, talked about using like video conferencing and other technology to help bring about some of the goals that have been talked about. And I was just curious, uh, from your perspectives of being part of the generation you know, that has had Facebook, et cetera, um, if you think that's a good idea, if you think it would be helpful, how do you uh, use new media or uh, to help deal, do some of the international type things that have been talked about it's here? It's a very important uh, and issue. Be willing to share new that. media and its role in education. Um, hello. Uh, first of all, I just want to know how, how was this panel created or selected? Sorry. How, how was this panel created or selected? Um, and also, I was just, I was just wondering if, if you guys had any um, challenges incorporating your global experience into your, your Columbia education, and yes or no, how you've done that. Okay. Hi. I know this may sound like something out of uh, uh, the dusty old attic, but I'm just wondering on a survey basis, how many of you have ever collected stamps as a, both a the local and a global view of the world? Okay, so those are the questions. You're um, free to pick which ones you want to answer. I'll talk about how like, the global aspect has been integrated into my major and into my experience here. Because I am prepared of literature and society, global studies is written into what I do um, in every single way, shape, and form. And I know that's not the same in other majors. And what I would actually like to see happen is to add a global aspect into the other majors as a distribution, um, because I think that would fix the problem of having to take extra classes and give us some more time to actually focus on global studies. So I've had no issue doing that. I don't collect stamps, but I collect postcards. media and video conferencing. Uh, when I was thinking about going to law school and exploring some of those goals, some of those goals have already moved into that direction where they video record all their classes, that they host courses abroad that students then back in the States can watch and they can be part of that class. Um, and so I definitely feel that it needs to be incorporated in some way. It's a way to bridge you know, the students that are studying here at Columbia and the students of the, of the other different centers in the world. Um, be able to access those same resources that they have. Uh, well, I don't believe it's the same thing as actually being there in person and being in that specific class where you can engage in those discussions, at least for lecture-based uh, classes. It's a great useful tool um, to allow students greater opportunities to engage with others. And like Erica, I collect postcards. Global citizen. And this is, oh, can, in terms of feeling like a global citizen, I think that Colombia has been incredibly stimulating in this respect. Um, I can tell you that last summer, I, as I had mentioned, I spent 10 days in China and two months in South Korea. And that was the first time I had ever been outside of North America. And one point I'd like to emphasize is that, sort of drawing back to societal discrepancies, I think the notion of the fifth year the notion of sending Columbia students in a Columbia-supported framework can be an incredible, incredibly valuable experience for people who haven't had the opportunity to travel so much in the past. Because what I can emphasize is that every time I go home to the suburbs of Vancouver, that I see myself changing in a way that I like. I see myself becoming very cognizant of different viewpoints and I don't see my peers from high school changing in that way. And I don't collect stamps, but my grandfather had a huge stamp collection. In terms of the question about incorporating the global aspect into your undergraduate career, um, because of my two majors, um, East Asian Studies and the Middle Eastern Studies, it's, uh, I incorporate them naturally, but I think that's something I'd like to emphasize for all undergraduates is um, to incorporate them through your extracurricular activities. And I think that this is another way in which the university can really help undergraduates um, in their sort of 
pursuit of global education and um, global knowledge, global experience through extracurriculars. There are, there's a huge variety of cultural clubs on campus. Um, both Erica, me, Mark, um, I'm not sure if you guys are involved, but a number of us are involved in them. Um, they also suffer from sometimes a lack of funding, actually often a lack of funding, and a lot of difficulty in getting what they want to do done, um, no matter what type of event it is. So I really encourage the university to help them in that, um, also help all of their clubs while they're at it. Um, and I also think that the university, while there, there's a great number of lectures, academic um, sort of offerings to undergraduates to pursue their sort of global ideas, um, I think that there can be way, other ways in which the university can help undergraduates in their um, global interests through extracurriculars. Um, the Weather Head East Asian Institute, um, which I actually work for as an intern, actually has a fabulous program called the um, Weather Head East Asian Institute Undergraduate Initiative. Um, and that's, um, so not only are there lectures, um, but there are also study breaks or sort of fun cultural events, outings into the city. Um, which undergraduates can sign up for and attend, and so they incorporate global learning in a very fun um, way. And I think that the I would encourage the other institutes to also do similar things. Oh, um, I don't collect stamps. I do have a postcard from everywhere I've ever been to. <laughs> uh, I want to respond to the I guess both of the questions about integrating the global experience and whether we feel like a global citizen. They seem to be related. Um, Personally, I'm not sure that, I think the kind of, I don't really do something positively to, to kind of check off the global box in my education. I'm not thinking about whether, am I being global enough right now? Um, have I, I mean, am I being too local? Like, I, I think that, and I, I'm not, I mean, I could speculate. I, I don't think most students uh, think about things that way, but it's, I mean, but that, that might go in different um, different routes. Um, and you think about whether we feel like a global citizen, um, my sense is that that's one of those phrases which when I was applying to college I would have found really appealing, but after four years I'm actually sort of wondering whether it actually means something. Um, and I, in one sense the whole idea of a global citizen is kind of oxymoronic. Um, and and how I would know if I was a global citizen is just completely mysterious. I mean, I don't know, would, would I know every language? Would I know all the countries? I mean, Immanuel Kant, I mean, he spent his whole life in, in one town, um, local town, but in some ways he was more of a global citizen, I mean, in, than, than anybody, um, than, than any of us, and I mean, than people who studied abroad, um, than people who took the, these, these grand tours, and, um, I think a better criterion maybe um, for students or maybe a more workable one is whether we're thinking about, I mean global is just really, I mean we haven't really talked about the fact that global can really mean anything. It's kind of a, a just this protean word that people like kind of throw around and it seems topical. Um, but the, I think when people really talk about global, they're talking about whether think, people are thinking in a kind of broad and critical way. and. I don't, I'm not sure that that means thinking in a kind of globally geographic way. Um, and in some ways, I think the best kind of preparation for a for global citizenship is a very deep engagement with um, stuff which might not seem global. Um, but I don't know. I'm, and uh, I haven't really uh, sent anything by hard mail in a long time. So. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, again, you've been terrific. You've said what you feel and believe and what you're thinking, and that's the most valuable uh, thing we have here. Uh, it's been great to, uh, to do this with you, so thanks very much. Thanks Thank very you. much.